productivity benefit, a cost reduction benefit from doing outsourcing, or is this just, uh, it's I'm paying less per hour, but I'm paying more per job well done. Um, now, if you've got a situation where development is being done offshore, offsite, then having co-located testing happening ideally with an outside test organization that's providing an independent check and balance on this outside development team, that can reduce the communication time and turnaround time on distributed testing and, and help make this, this faster. Um, use of testers with specialized skills. Now, you know, certainly one of the things that, that I pride myself on with, the, with my company is that we are able to put people, highly skilled people on projects on demand in various places around the world, have done it on many projects. So that's one of the things that I consider ourselves good at is delivering the right skills and right location, uh, filling skills gaps in, in organizations. Also, test labs with specialized facilities or tools. That, that can be another benefit of using an outsourced testing organization. Things like compatibility testing and performance testing involve a fairly extensive investment in tools and, and infrastructure. And maybe there's not a whole lot of value in, in buying that if you just want to rent it every now and then. Uh, similarly, localization testing. Localization testing is very expensive to build a localization test capability in a country where some of the languages you're trying to cover are hard to find. Now, I'm here in San Francisco right now, and San Francisco is a unique city in this regard in that you probably could find somebody that spoke just about any language in the world here. Uh, similarly, with Los Angeles and New York, you could, you could probably do that. But outside of those few notable exceptions, most places in the world you know, you're, you're, you're pretty limited to what kind of language localization testing that you could do. And operational localization testing is always a problem. If you want to test with the uh, phone systems or communication infrastructure that's, that's in place in certain countries, there's really no substitute for doing it in that country. So that's, that's another potential advantage of distributed testing. Okay, so... Um, what are the next steps? We've gone through five testing best practices. Um, you know, what, what should you do now with this information? And hopefully you weren't, uh, you weren't just curious. You were looking for something to, to do. So which of the five best practices are you currently practicing? Um, and for those, how could you do them better? What are your opportunities to, to improve? Uh, which of the five best practices are you not practicing? Would it make sense to put those into action? Does distributed testing make sense if you're not currently doing that, for example? It's not necessarily the case that the answer is yes, we should do this, right? As I said at the outset, you know, the key here with the best practice is the intelligent and thoughtful, appropriate application of it. And if, for whatever reason, one or more of these best practices is not applicable in your situation, you shouldn't do it. Um, now, how, how would you evaluate these things? How would you know how you're doing and how you, what you should do? Well, basically, the, the approach to use here, if you want to give a really end-to-end -end systemic perspective, is some sort of assessment of your test operation, looking for your current capability and your opportunities to improve. Now, you have a lot of different options for how to do that. At, at one end is you hire a consulting company like my own to come in go through a formal assessment process, give you a report at the end that says, okay, here are our findings, here's what we came up with, here are our recommendations, here's an action plan to put those recommendations into, into effect. Uh, at the other end, you can just pick up a book, like Critical Testing Processes, my own book, or other books out there that describe various testing frameworks and test assessment uh, models, and self-assess. And, you know, the end result is going to be more or less the same thing. You're going to have a set of recommendations and an action plan. You know, the question is, you know, do, do I have the time and the energy to go through and do this assessment and ramp up on it, or would it be cheaper and faster just to have somebody from outside come in and do it? Because it's usually it's a couple weeks' worth of work. It's about it for a single-site assessment. So however you get there, you've now got some recommendations, these are the things I want to do, whether you do a narrow scope and just say I'm going to focus on the five best practices we talked about or 
broad scope assessment. You got a plan, you execute on that plan, follow through on the plan, measure the, the results. Okay, so I will, as usual, uh, put up the, the advertisement here while we do the Q&A session. And um, as I said, we are going to start with uh, our uh, folks in the room here, the UBC folks, and take any questions that they might have first. And, um, open it up. Uh, slide four, you start up a risk-based uh, testing in action. Mm -hmm. Just kind of curious, do you advocate more of the top-down or the bottom-up approach to looking at risk, so like an FDA or an FMEA? Or um, <clears throat> what I've found is that the really the really formalized approaches like failure mode and effect analysis. I, I've used failure mode and effect analysis for years, and that was actually how I learned to do risk-based testing. And um, the problem that I've had with that is, you know, being a consultant, it's, it's my job to know obscure things that are hard to do, right? But what I've found is that trying to get most people started doing risk-based testing, that's just too big of a step for them. All right, so it's not so much a bottom-up versus top-down. It's really a level of rigor and formality issue. And what I like to do is start with this, this fairly informal approach where I've got a, a high-level list of, of risk categories, quality risk categories, and then I brainstorm either in one-on-one -on -one interviews or in a big group brainstorming session to identify risk items. Um, so I, I guess you could you could call that top-down-ish in the sense that it's, it's decomposing from a uh, high-level checklist down into individual risk items. But the, the key to me there really is the keeping it, keeping it lightweight. So I would say that that's been the most important lesson I've learned over 10 plus years of helping clients get started doing risk-based testing is, you know, small steps, right? And the, the analogy that I often use is when you learn to ride a bicycle, it's not like your parents brought you Lance Armstrong's bicycle and dropped it in your, you know, front lawn and said, "There you go, there's a bicycle." You know, you, you start off, you get a tricycle, and then you know, bike with training wheels, and the training wheels come off, and then you get gears and brakes and you know, hand brakes and so forth. There's a, there's a gradual increase in complexity there because there's a lot going on, and I think there's a, that's a really good analogy for risk-based testing. Is it? It, it's conceptually fairly straightforward. What you're trying to accomplish with it is, but there's a lot of stuff in motion at once. And if you try to do something that's too complicated, you'll just you'll fail. And we just last year had that happen. We went in to work with a client that was that had tried to self-start using fair mode and effect analysis, and it just it was a resounding failure because it was just too hard for everybody. Okay. Other uh, questions. Um. If you're making the same stuff over and over again, if you're a repetitive software house, mm -hmm. uh, then there's the risk, uh, it's the risk that your risk matrix or assessments become almost perfunctory, that people don't, how do you ensure that? Because if you're doing the same thing again and again and again, yeah. and it almost becomes like, well, here's the list, yeah, 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 yeah. How do you avoid that or how do you refocus that so it's always novel and it's always truly taken under consideration versus becoming. I mean, the first couple times, they're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you know, yeah. you're on your 50th. Well, I mean, I think one, one thing that's definitely true if you're, if you're in sort of a maintenance mode or a um, cookie cutter is the wrong word, but when you're, when you're doing things that are very similar, I think you want to look at the risk assessment as 